What is going to work for the Democratic Party? Work in the sense of getting more voters to choose the color blue and then stay there beyond the 2018 midterms all the way into 2020. Well, some say that the Democrats need to swing more to the left, to the kinds of ideas and promises that under the rubric of progressive populism set the party up as standing for game-changing policies like Medicare for all, or tuition-free public education, or a guaranteed federal jobs program. But hold on, others say, including a lot of Democrats, those are promises that cannot possibly or reasonably be kept, and they may sound so radical to so many that they will push more voters away than they will pull in. Better, they say, to let the Dems stay close to the center and let the Republicans look like the outliers. Who is right? Well, let's find out, because we think this has the makings of a debate. Yes or no to this statement, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. I'm John Donvan, and I stand between two teams of two thinkers on this topic who will argue for and against that resolution. As always, our debate will go in three rounds, and then our live audience here at the K Playhouse at Hunter College in New York City will vote to choose the winner. And if all goes well, civil discourse will also win. Our resolution is progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. We have one team arguing for that resolution. Let's meet them, starting with first, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again, Corinne Jean-Pierre. Corinne, welcome to Intelligence Squared US. Uh, you are right now senior advisor and national spokesperson for MoveOn.org. You're also a lecturer at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Before that, uh, you were in the White House under President Obama. You worked on both of his presidential campaigns. You were a campaign manager for the ACLU's Initiative on Reproductive Freedom, and most recently, the deputy campaign manager for Martin O'Malley for president. That is a lot of political <laughs> experience. You have credited your career and your success to your parents. Absolutely. Why? Why is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. First of all, thank you all for coming in, in this weather. Really good to see everybody, and thank you, Hunter College, for having us. Yeah, I accredit everything to my parents. Uh, my parents are uh, from Haiti. They are immigrants. They came here decades ago. At the time, uh, Haiti was a, a dictatorship, and uh, they, they wanted the American dream. They had heard about the American dream. And so through that, through their travel, they ended up here in New York City grew up in, in New York, and, um, and they've worked so hard, and their heart and determination, their love for this country and the country where they were born, uh, really gave me kind of the, the fuel to do everything that I've done, as John was listing, in my career. And without them, I don't think I would have ever ended up in the White House. And because of them, I still continue the work that I do through Move On. And, uh, and, and so it's my parents and my daughter that really fuels me today. And my hope is that not only will she go for the American dream, but that she will realize the American dream. Because so many people in this country are trying to realize the American dream still, so. Thank you, Karine Jean-Pierre. Thanks. And your partner is Jeff Weaver. Jeff, welcome to Intelligence Squared. Thank you. You are a longtime advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. When he ran for president in 2016, you were his campaign manager. Um, you also managed his Senate election campaign in 2006. You are the author of a book, new book called How Bernie Won, Inside the Revolution That's Taking Back Our Country and Where We Go From Here. It came out in May. Jeff, Bernie didn't win. Um, so what do you mean when you say he won? Well, Bernie did win. If you look, Medicare for All is now supported by 80% of Democrats and 52% of Republicans. The minimum wage is being raised to $15 all over this country. Uh, people are talking about free college, uh, free tuition of public colleges and universities. And we're having a debate like this tonight, and this is a testament to how Bernie won. Thank you very much, Jeff Weaver. Again, our resolution is progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. We have two debaters arguing against it. First, please welcome Jonathan Cowan. John, welcome to IQ2. You have over 25 years of experience at senior levels of politics and government. You were a Democratic press secretary in Congress. You were a chief of staff at the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the Clinton administration. You're here tonight most specifically, though, because you're the co-founder and president of a moderate democratic think tank called Third Way. Tell the moderator what moderate means to you. <laughs> Uh, moderate Democrat to me means a commitment to bold, modern ideas and a willingness and a conviction to think outside the blue bubble. 
Thank you, John Cowan. Very short and sweet. And you also have a partner uh, in this debate, Stephen Ratner. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Ratner. Stephen, welcome back to Intelligence Squared. You've debated with us before. It's wonderful to have you back. You are chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors and an economic analyst for MSNBC. Uh, you also have a lot of experience in politics. Uh, you were counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury. You were uh, most notably President Obama's car czar. Um, you uh, defended the motion last time you were with us. Obama's economic policies are working effectively. That was back in 2009, nine years ago. So curious, under President Trump, are we still feeling the effects of Obama's policies? You know, it's so interesting to think back to 2009 and the idea that that was actually a debatable subject because I think the last nine years uh, would eliminate any debate as to whether his policies were effective. And if you need any proof of that, Donald Trump is trying to take credit for it pretty much every day. All right. <laughs> Again, short and sweet and to the point. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Ratner and the team arguing <laughs> against the motion. Let's move on to debate. Debate begins with round one. Those are opening statements by each debater in turn. Speaking first, for the motion, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Here is Jeff Weaver, senior political advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Weaver. I, I want to thank you all for coming out. This is a very important question at this very uh, difficult time in our nation's uh, political history. Uh, every day we are reminded that in many ways our country is on the edge of a knife. And we can slide either way. I think all of us recognize the great harm that Trump is doing in this country, the type of hateful rhetoric he's injecting into our country, and the way he is changing the mindset of so many people in this country toward a more a divisive uh, and destructive uh, mentality. Uh, and it's our job, and I, you'll hear some allusions from me later in my comments about the 1930s in America, but in many ways, we are confronting something that our allies confronted in Western Europe in the 1930s uh, in Europe. And they failed in their attempt to strike down sort of ultranationalism uh, and xenophobia and racism, and we cannot afford to fail. There's no one to come. There's no greater, greatest generation somewhere else to come here and protect us. What does that mean? That means we have got to galvanize uh, the, the American people, the grassroots of the American people. We've got to unify the American people uh, and create a country, that, as Bernie says, that uh, in a government and an economy that works for uh, everyone. And I think as we go through this tonight, we talk a little bit about the history of the Democratic Party and where we are today, um, I think you will see that not only is the sort of neoliberal corporatist view incapable of confronting and defeating Trump, but in many ways is responsible for its rise in this country. Uh, our great party, the Democratic Party, the modern Democratic Party, was born in the crucible of the New Deal. Uh, FDR, uh, came into power at a time of great economic calamity, as all of you know. It was a worldwide uh, depression. Uh, and against great opposition from Republicans, from business interests, and frankly, from many inside the Democratic Party, uh, put together a coalition, uh, created Social Security, created workers' rights, created a lot of investments uh, in this country that we still see today, the TVA and other things, um, that created dominance by Democratic politics in this country for decades, uh, this coalition this grand uh, New Deal coalition. And our job in this country is to rebuild that grand uh, New Deal coalition. This cannot be a party of only upper middle income people, of only well-to-do suburbanites. This has got to be a party that represents also working class people and marginalized communities. And what those people understand is that we have big problems in this country and we need bold solutions. And the solutions that are being offered by people in the sort of progressive populist camp are not unrealistic we're undoable if we have the political will in this country. We live in the richest country in the history of the world. All of our Western Democratic allies have universal health care. We do not. We used to have free tuition at public colleges and universities in this country. That's not a new thing. That's kind of an old thing. We used to have that, and we have lost it. Uh, the value of the minimum wage has degraded over time. But working people need to have a decent a standard of living uh, in this country, whether that's through legislation or putting pressure on companies, as we've seen recently. Senator Sanders got a third of a million people uh, a raise at Amazon.com. Uh, so uh, we have got to energize and excite people. And what has happened is, uh, after this period of dominance, we had the Reagan uh, revolution, although we did not lose the, the House during that time period. We should remember that. We had the Reagan re revolution. And then a group of folks came along and said, the problem with the Democratic Party is 
we're not really enough in the pocket of Wall Street and financial interests. And if we do that, we can, we can really win. And they did win. In, in 1992, Bill Clinton won with 43% of the vote. It was a three-way race, as people may remember. And two years, he's, then he went down a path of neoliberal economics. We had NAFTA, we had most favored nation status with China, and we destroyed the relationship between the Democratic Party and its historic working class base in this country. In 1994, we lost the House of Representatives for the first time since 1952. Uh, seeing that kind of loss and the disconnection between working class people and the party, they turned to a very ugly set of policies. DOMA, to attack the LGBT community. Welfare reform, which was a pared down version of Reagan's welfare queen uh, uh, program. Uh, the crime bill, which created mass incarceration in this country. <clears throat> we forget that Bill Clinton and Joe Biden are the fathers of mass incarceration in America. And since then, uh, we have been trying to find our way. And in 2016, the grassroots of this party said, no more. We want to stand up. We want to reclaim our New Deal heritage. We want to be the dominant party in this country again for decades to come. We want to bring people together and not divide them up. We have got to serve the interests of working people, marginalized communities, and not the rich and the powerful. And I hope you vote for us at the end of this process. Thank you, Jeff Weaver. The resolution, again, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. And here to make his opening statement against the motion, please welcome Jonathan Cowan, co-founder and president of Third Way. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Cowan. The question before us is this. If Democrats run on the ideas of the progressive populace, Will that save the Democratic Party? Will these ideas win elections everywhere so that we can defeat Trump in 2020? The answer is no. Let's start with what we, all of us on this stage, have in common. We are all excited about the new generation of candidates hailing from all ideological wings. Young people, women, and people of color are adding dynamism and diversity to the Democratic Party. But where we disagree is over the ideas these candidates should be carrying. The evidence is overwhelming that populist ideas will not help Democrats regain the White House or majorities. They might look good on a bumper sticker. But when voters hear about the details, support crumbles. Take their centerpiece idea, Medicare for all. It has been tested, and it has failed. In 2016, the purple state of Colorado had a Medicare for All style initiative on the ballot. It was decimated. 79% voted no. It lost in liberal Boulder. In deep blue Vermont, the state passed single payer in 2011 and gave up on it just three years later because the costs and tax increases were simply too high. Now, I admit that during these midterm general elections, there have been lots of Medicare for All ads on the air. But here's the rub. They're not being aired by Democrats. They're being aired by Republicans as attack ads on Democrats. The GOP knows that if they can label every Democrat as a backer of Medicare for All, as well as other far left ideas like abolishing ICE, they can retain the House. So yes, their signature ideas are politically potent for Republicans. Progressive populist ideas are not going to elect Democrats and save us from Trump, and Democratic voters agree. Bernie Sanders and his allies proclaimed that this would be their year. And to prove it, they backed a lot of Democratic primary candidates carrying his agenda. Well, the primaries are over. And how did they do? 23 million people just voted in the Democratic primaries. They were our most energized and committed voters, turning out in historic numbers to put a check on Trump. And they represented a big tent Democratic party, young and old, urban, suburban, and rural, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. And most of them voted for the more mainstream Democrat and against the Democratic Socialist. Yes. There were notable exceptions, 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib won by running inspired races in cobalt blue districts. But mainstream Democrats won almost everywhere else. In the House, non-incumbent candidates aligned with the moderate New Democrats won 32 of their 37 primaries, a stunning 86% win rate. Meanwhile, our revolution, the group formed by supporters of Bernie Sanders, had a dismal 39% win rate. So if running on a Sanders-style platform is the way for Democrats to regain power, someone had better tell the 23 million Democratic primary voters who felt otherwise. And if candidates carrying these ideas can't win primaries, that agenda clearly has no chance of delivering victories in a general election. In June of 2017, Bernie Sanders published an op-ed titled, quote, How Democrats Can Stop Losing Elections. In it, he proclaimed that his ideas were the key to victory. But on the very day it was published, Democratic primary voters in Virginia had to choose between Ralph Northam and Tom Perriello as their gubernatorial nominee. Perriello, a talented former congressman, proudly embraced a populist agenda and even featured Bernie in his ads. Northam ran as a proud moderate. So it was a great field experiment for tonight's debate motion. If progressive populist ideas are the way to win, then especially in a Democratic primary, it must be that the populist Perriello won handily. The reality, Northam crushed him by 12 points and went on to easily win the general election. That Virginia win by a moderate kicked off the primary season. Andrew Cuomo's resounding victory over Cynthia Nixon marked the last. With a handful of exceptions, primaries in the 48 states in between delivered similar results. Democrats chose moderate nominees who fit their districts and states and were best positioned to win in a general election. So remember, if you vote for this motion, you're not saying that democratic socialist ideas and the candidates carrying them can win in Queens. You're saying that these populist ideas can win and save the Democratic Party everywhere. 23 million Democratic primary voters just weighed in on this question. And if they were here tonight, most of them would once again vote no on this proposition. I hope you'll do the same. Thank you, Jonathan Cowan. You've heard the first two opening statements, and now on to the third, debating for the resolution, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Here is Karine Jean-Pierre, senior advisor and national spokesperson for MoveOn.org. Ladies and gentlemen, Karine Jean-Pierre. So let's step back for a second and actually define what we're here to debate. First, populism. Populism is defined in the dictionary as support for the concerns of ordinary people. And I would say everybody here on stage probably agrees with that. Now let's go down a little deeper and really get into the discussion. Populism is not about right versus left, but it's about top versus bottom. P populism actually offers up solutions. How? Well, one of the solutions that it offers up is how do we fight against a society that benefits the privilege, the elites? Now, there are many forms of populism. Donald Trump has his form of populism rhetoric, but his populism is right-wing, white nationalist populism. He chooses to divide the country using race, religion, immigration status, and gender. Progressive populism unifies and brings us all together. The late Senator Paul Wellstone used to say, when we all do better, we all do better when we all do better. Now, economics is key. It's a key tenet of progressive populism, but it's not the only thing. We also have to talk about the systems, the power of systems that are created to help, to benefit the privilege and the elites. And I'm talking about white supremacy, 
I'm talking about patriarchy, Islamophobia, and also he heterosexism, which is what, which, what pro progressive populism does. It fights against that. It says no to that. So we also need, we need inclusive populism and also multiracial populism. Now, many of our opponents would say what we're talking about is identity politics, and identity politics divides people. But then I would say, how are we supposed to get justice if we don't know the reality of our identities? How do we not define who's at the top and who's at the bottom? How do we move forward? As I mentioned earlier in my opening, my parents were immigrants. My dad was a New York City cab driver, my mom a home health care aide. And I would argue, and I think I would be right to say that what they, the issues that, they, that matter to them also matter to their white working class counterparts. But look, I'm not here to define really, that's not the role that I'm supposed to do, but I wanted to give you a sense of populism and progressive populism, what that means. I'm supposed to give you an argument as to why progressive populism is the future of the Democratic Party. Jeff did a good job giving the history of populism. I'm gonna give you some data points. Progressive populism, as I mentioned, has solutions. Our solutions are actually incredibly popular. For example, Medicare for All. Lake Research did a survey back in April and asked voters in, in, um, in battleground congressional districts how they felt about Medicare for All. 54% strongly support Medicare for All. But I think the most interesting thing about that survey was that Democrats who are infrequent voters, it was more popular with them. So progressive politics favors debt-free college, which is popular. It favors universal childcare, which is popular. Affordable homeownership, which is important. And we also believe in the auto bailout, which was incredibly successful. Thank you, Steve Ratner. And it was a great example of how activism, how government, when they step into activism, can really help the markets and intervene in the markets. That's what it did. But now I want to talk about the successful candidates who were progressive populists that are currently happening right now and not in blue states, I'm talking about deep red states. The first one is Beto O'Rourke. He's running in Texas. Donald Trump won Texas by nine points. Mitt Romney won Texas by 16 points. Beto O'Rourke is authentic. He's fighting for the people, he's progressive. He's not taking PAC money, he's not taking corporation money, and he's doing really well in that race. Wendy Davis, who lost that who lost the governor's race a couple years ago by 20 points said that she would, want, would run a more progressive campaign, a more authentic campaign if she were to do it again. Andrew Gillum, incredibly progressive, making history. And in the naysayers in the primary had said, oh, he's too progressive, he's too liberal, there's no way. He came out in the general election, has been leading in all of the polls in Florida. Trump won that by one or two points. All the past Democratic candidates who were, who were in the middle have never done as well as he's doing right now. And the irony of that is he's probably going to, on his coattails, help Bill Nelson win, who's a centrist. Look, it's not gonna be up to us who are on stage that's going to decide what the, what the Democratic Party is going to do. It's going to be up to activists and voters out in the country, across the country, and they're making it loud and clear. They want the Democratic Party to be, to challenge, I should say, status quo, and to fight for the 99%, not the 1%. So progressive populism is the future of the Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you, Camille Jean-Pierre. And that is the resolution. Progressive populism will save the Democratic Party and here to make his statement against the motion. Please welcome Stephen Ratner, Chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors and former counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Ratner. Thanks. Uh, let me start by echoing what John said. I'm a Democrat and I consider myself a progressive and I consider myself as a fighter for the 99% as I think it should be defined. I believe that our tax system excessively favors the rich. 
I believe that income inequality in our country is at reprehensible levels and must be addressed. I believe that the federal government should lean in and try to solve the pressing problems of those who have been left behind. I believe that America has an important role to play in the world, including by imparting our values of democracy and human rights. But I don't believe that endorsing policy ideas that are either unaffordable or make little economic sense or would do more harm than good, or all three, would somehow be good politics for the Democratic Party. Let me do my historical review. There has not been a single Democratic president elected in our history espousing the kinds of policies that the proponents of this motion advocate. Not FDR Jeff, who ran in 1932 on a platform of balancing the budget. Not John F. Kennedy, who, by the way, cut taxes for the rich. Not Jimmy Carter, who ran as a self-styled New Democrat. Certainly not Bill Clinton. And not even Barack Obama, who Senator Sanders attacked as weak for not pushing more robust, i.e. progressive, politi policies. Then there are the losers. George McGovern, who carried just one state and the District of Columbia in 1972. In 1984, Walter Mondale suffered exactly the same fate. Just four years after that, Michael Dukakis was trounced, 426 electoral votes to 111. All of us up here agree that the election of Donald Trump was one of the saddest days of our lifetime. And with, an, and with an approval rating hovering around 43%, there's no way he should be reelected. But if we want to make the unimaginable imaginable, just nominate someone out of touch with the mainstream of this country. We can talk all we want about energizing the base, but remember that only 33% of Americans are even Democrats at all. It's also worth noting that the share of independence at 37% is the highest in 27 years. Last I looked, you needed around 50% to win. You've heard the suggestion that Bernie Sanders could have beaten Donald Trump. We'll never know, but we do know a few things. For starters, it has historically always been very difficult and rare for someone of the same party as a two-term incumbent to win the presidency. After, it, after eight years, voters generally want to change, as they did in 2008 and again in 2016. We won't have that impediment in 2020, but we will have a more important problem that hurt Mrs. Clinton, the fact that Democratic voters are increasingly concentrated geographically, particularly in big blue states like New York and California. That's a large part of why Mrs. Clinton lost, even though she got three million more votes than Donald Trump. So to win, we must reach out to more moderate voters in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, and in Wisconsin, three states that we never should have lost. Lastly, you've heard turnout blamed for Senator, Secretary Clinton's loss, but at 60.1%, turnout was higher in 2016 than it was for Barack Obama's reelection in 2012. Now let's turn to policy. John made a compelling case for why Medicare for all is bad politics. The same would inevitably be true of some of the other ideas that Senator Sanders and his sympathizers have put, fo put forth once the electorate understood the implications. Guarantee a $15 an hour income to all, that would cost on the order of $680 billion annually. How about providing a $12,000 a year basic income to every American? The bill for that, a whopping $3.8 trillion per year, and given that our tax revenue runs about $3.5 trillion annually, paying for that would require doubling taxes. Expand Social Security? That sounds pretty good, until Americans understand that the trust fund is on track to go broke in 2034 and jeopardize the benefits that we've already promised. Just wait until the voters go to Sanders' website, as I did, and find him absurdly claiming that Social Security has a $2.8 trillion surplus. Make public colleges uh, and uni uh, universities tuition free, as Jeff suggested. It's a great goal for the underprivileged. But if any of my kids were to go to a public institution, I have no idea why they should get a free ride. Break up the big banks, that sounds appealing, although apparently not to Mr. Sanders' Senate colleagues, none of whom have signed on as co-sponsors of his bill. Abolish ICE, only 32% of voters want that, while 53% understand that immigration and customs service, albeit with reforms, is something that we need to have. Even among Democrats, only 44% want to abolish ICE. As I close, I want to re-emphasize the extent to which I share the goals of the populace. I share everything that has been said uh, before me as a goal. 
but we should address the critical issues facing our nation by putting forward responsible, prudent policies that will attract the coalition of voters that we need to keep Donald Trump from another four years of destroying America. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Radner. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where our resolution is progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Now we move on to round two, and in round two, the debaters address one another directly, and they take questions from me and from you, our live audience here in New York City. Our resolution is this, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. What we seem to be hearing about, basically, is a, a dispute over how most m voters or many voters will respond to the set of policies that are identified with progressive populism. The team arguing for the resolution, Karine Jean-Pierre and Jeff Weaver, are arguing that, in fact, these ideas would be very popular, they would be vote-getters. They describe, in this country, a sense of emergency in the light of things like xenophobia and ultranationalism and racism that requires the Democratic Party to go back, they say, to its New Deal roots, to the kind of emergency that preceded the New Deal, a time when bold solutions were required and bold solutions were put into place. They also describe a tension between top and bottom, and in that framework they say these are solutions that appeal to the bottom. Ideas like Medicaid for all, free, college, uh, free public college tuition, abolishing ICE, housing as a human right. Their bottom line is that these things are needed, these things will be popular, these things are what the party should and will stand, for, will stand for and will also get votes. The team arguing against the resolution, Jonathan Cowan and Stephen Ratner, they identify themselves as progressives, but they say the problem with their opponents' ideas is a thing that I think I could describe as political reality. They say that if these ideas just are unsustainable, they can't be carried through, that the public sniffs that out, that these ideas will scare the public, they look great on a bumper sticker, but in reality, voters will not go for them, that they, they cite instance after instance were given the opportunity to either vote for these things they voted against, or when put in place, they ultimately failed. They say these ideas will, in fact, help the Republicans the more that they can be identified with the Democratic Party. Um, so I, I think that that gives us an, an overall sense of what the issues are here. And I want to take a question to you, Jeff Weaver, from something that your opponent said in that the, the Democrats need to have moderates come into the tent. And the, what occurred to me is it almost sounded as though they were saying that you and Kareen are arguing for appealing to the Democratic base and that the moderates, not that they don't matter, but that, they're, that you, you just can't get them. I want to see if I, if I understand that correctly. Yeah, well, that is not what we're saying. And, uh, and I, it's interesting you wanna, if you want to talk about elections because we just had a presidential election, and so we have a lot of experience. We had a hard-fought Democratic primary between Secretary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Uh, and the evidence is pretty clear. I've seen a zillion polls in a zillion states, as you can probably imagine. And Bernie Sanders was winning rural Democrats, conservative Democrats, moderate Democrats. Uh, and Secretary Clinton was doing much better with suburban Democrats who on paper look liberal because they are, you know, they're pro-choice and they are support an end of global warming and so on and so forth. So the modeling that was done clearly showed that Bernie was winning the very voters that you were talking about in red places. They were coming out overwhelmingly for Bernie Sanders, which is why he won in Oklahoma, he won in Kansas, he won in Nebraska, he won in Utah, he won in Idaho, and on and on uh, it goes. And in fact, it is these voters uh, that we need to, that, that I'm arguing we need to bring back into the tent. Working class voters in red states, this question about geographic concentration of Democratic support is a very, very serious uh, problem that we have in an electoral college system. And we need to broaden our support geographically. And the way you do that is by being unapologetically on the side of working people in these states. We all forget that the, the Midwest of this country used to be the center of progressive politics in this country. The Plain okay. States was where progressivism rose in this country. And we have lost touch with those people because the truth of the matter is that there are many people in that wing of the party who really don't like those people very much. Okay, Jeff, let me, let me break into let your opponents respond to some of what you said, because you said a lot. John Cowan, um, basically, Jeff is saying that the, those voters in the red states that you say would be driven away by these ideas would not be driven away. Okay, well, let me address that. But first, let me address the last comment you made, and maybe I misunderstood it. But if you're saying that I do not like a bunch of working class voters, that's beyond offensive and ridiculous. As, as long as you don't Excuse have to do me, Jeff, to really let me finish. Them. That's offensive and ridiculous, well, I'm, okay? I, I'm I've sorry, devoted 25 years of my life to democratic policy and policymaking. 
I was the chief of staff of the Department of Housing and Development and visited hundreds of public housing developments all over America. So that's offensive. The debate is not whether we feel or you feel more passionately about helping the struggling and working middle class of this country. The question is, and you keep trying to reframe the question, the question is this. Not whether people in the audience like your ideas, it's whether those ideas will win elections. And they don't win elections. That's just That's not the true. Old, I'm sorry. Not a, di true. a different debate another night is the policy merits of them or, in fact, whether people love them more or less. But that's not the question. The question is, if Democrats run on your ideas, will they win? We just had, not a poll, we just had an actual election of 23 million Democratic primary voters. And however you feel about Sanders and his ideas, whatever you feel about them, the result is unequivocal. Democratic primary voters of all different kinds in all different places in the country chose candidates who are not the passionate supporters okay. of your ideas. Let no. me bring in Corrine. <laughs> so, uh, just to be fair, John, you said liven it up and leap in, so. <laughs> I don't no. want it to look like I'm obnoxious. I'm yes, just let's saying. Let's not forget the election you we had in well, 2020. Well, let, let me, let me Corrine, before really you speak, lost. before yeah. you speak, uh, we, we, we like to keep this <laughs> friendly. <laughs> trying to think of the words. Not, happy is not the word. Friendly is the word. And I, the fact that your opponent took such direct offense of what you said. Do you want to say anything about that? No, I do want to say something about it, because if you're going to win elections... You no, 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 I mean a, the fact that he took personal offense. Oh, I'm sorry you took personal offense. How's that? That's not kind of offhanded. All right, that's an unapology that's apology. A, I'll go to Corrine. That, that, that's right. <laughs> Corrine, you're up. I, you know, there, there are currently in this election cycle, we do have some history makers, and those history makers are running on progressive issues. Those history makers are diverse. And they're running on issues that are actually popular. And I don't think they would have ended up in a general election in these competitive races if that wasn't the case. I mentioned Andrew Gillum. That's amazing. This is Florida that we're talking about. And, and the naysayers, as I was saying in my presentation, said he couldn't do it. He was too progressive. He was too liberal. And he beat out, was it four or five centrist millionaires, millionaires Democrats? I, so this argument, and he's not from a blue state, you know, he's from a, he's from a, a red state. And let's not forget Stacey Abrams, who could potentially make history in 20 some odd days, who has a history of also working across the aisle, which yes. is great, but she's literally running an ad right now, labeling herself a pragmatic leader, and she was attacked from the left from being too centrist during her primary. Who's so, who's attacking her from the left? Who? During her primary, she what, was attacked what? from the left. From who? So, the person she was running against yeah. was not her, from but, the left. So who are you talking about? But uh, again, Stace, attacked by whom, though? I, I passionately support Stacey Abrams. Yeah, but you can't put that that statement <laughs> and say she was attacked by no one was. We were supporting her. No, Mubarak no, no. Was one of her the first opponent. Her opponent. Her opponent, in opponent the race. was to her right. To her no, opponent her was only a opponent was not. Yes, to her right. she was. No. The okay, other. So we have we have an yes, impasse on that. Karina, I, I, I want to give you an, another 30 seconds because I want to bring Steve Ratner in, but to finish your point. Yeah, I'm just saying that we have candidates in uh, red states, not blue states, who are doing incredibly well, who are making these races competitive, and they're running on progressive issues. Okay. So, Steve Ratner, to respond to, in, in other words, your opponents are look, saying, look, here's, here's this case, here's this case, here's this, this case, not just in cobalt blue areas. Well, you kind of made my point for me. Uh, Karine uses the word, there are some history makers. Some. I agree. There are some history makers. Unfortunately, they are a small number of history makers against a much larger group That's of examples. True. Can I? Let me finish. Uh, against a much oh, larger okay. group of examples that John just ran through of many cases, case after case after case during this primary season, 23 million votes in which... Uh, in, which the country, in which the Democratic Party, before we even get to the rest of the electorate, but the registered Democrats chose the moderates. With respect to 2016, yes, I would absolutely concede that Senator Sanders has an appeal to a certain group of working class Democrats who find his, some of his populist ideas uh, appealing. However, that was not enough to get him to win. He lost the primaries to Hillary Clinton by four million votes, if I remember correctly. So, that, so we've had that test. We've had a centrist, moderate, whatever you want to call Mrs. Clinton. I think she's a liberal. And you've had someone who is very, very progressive, 
within the Democratic Party, before you even get to the electorate, and the Democrats, the registered Democrats, said we want to go this way. And that is the preponderance of the outcomes. Not that there aren't examples that uh, support your thesis, but they are a small number of examples right, against a large number. But your candidate couldn't beat Trump. Excuse me? Your candidate could not beat Trump, and another candidate like that Our, candidate wait, won't no, beat him in no, 2020. No, Our, no. First of, all, you're, first of all, you have no way of knowing that, number one. Number you two, didn't win. We know hey, that. But your no. candidate couldn't beat our candidate. Yeah, so, yeah. Was, if your candidate was, couldn't beat our candidate, how your candidate be? <laughs> he was at so I, don't, I mean, that seems like a rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> no, but the question is, what's the future for the party? If the party continues to go with you guys, they will continue to but, lose But to when Trump. you say if and the party worse. continues to go with us guys, the, the, par, the, par, the last two Democrats to win the White House back to back were us guys. I mean, your guy said our guy, Obama, was not progressive. And I know what he thinks of Bill Clinton. So our guys are the last two Democrats to win the White House well, twice back just, to back. Isn't and, that the objective? And, and okay. not just the last two. I mean, give me an example of one Democrat who's won the White House going down your road. Nobody. Mondale, Dukakis, McGovern got massacred. Well, I would massacred. Can I, I, I would can can all in yeah, category. Can, so I have to push back on Steve Ratner. Um, Move On has uh, endorsed more than 200 candidates across the country who are progressive candidates, who are diverse, who are in states like Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and they're running on a progressive message. And so to say that, yeah, I said some are making history because the ones that I named were making really big history. We're talking about Florida and Georgia and, and Senate uh, gov gubernatorial races. But we have. We've, we searched for them. They came out, and they're running really important races. I do want to go back because you guys keep wanting to go back to 2016. Let's go back to 2016 for a second. So 2016, there were 46.9% 40, of registered voters who did not come out to vote. Six. Hillary Clinton got 6.8 million less voters than Obama did in 2012. And the reason why, there are many reasons why, I think they were not excited enough. You had young people who stayed home. I think that the 46.9 the, the million, many of them were from our side, the Democratic side and the Republican side. And also you had a system that was rigged. And what I mean by that is in 2013, the Voting Rights Act was gutted. And so what did you see? You see voter, voter ID laws, these awful voter ID laws come up, pop up all across the country. In Wisconsin, there were more than 200,000 voters who were not able to vote, who were disenfranchised. In North Carolina. So there's, so there's a couple of things here. There's a system that needs to be fixed that is for the 1%, not the 99%. And also we need to energize. We need to really give issues to voters, our so, base, oh, that gets them out there. So let can me, I, can I just do right a right factual right. correction? Hillary Clinton got almost exactly the same number of votes in 2016 as Barack Obama got in 2012. That's not what I read today. Well, that's a fact. Uh, 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 so that, your facts are right and my facts are wrong? Is that what well, you're saying? Well, you, you may have alternative facts. But I may I not have, have alternative facts. facts. But I have facts that I actually no, looked I, up. You know, I, I have to keep reminding myself, you guys all belong to the same party. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. The Democratic <laughs> Party. Yeah. Well, let me, let me take to John Cowan what I think I heard Karine just saying, is that these ideas could be so energizing that they will bring people out of the voting woodwork who have, who have, who have, who have chosen to sit it out before. And, and I think their, their whole message was this need to reconnect with the bottom. This, the, I, I'm uncomfortable using the term bottom, but I'm using it because this I did. But to, to the bottom socioeconomic sector of society, the working person, that they're, they're disengaged, and that there was a coalition, there could be a coalition, that could be excited into voting for these ideas and, and therefore changing the game. Of okay. course it's all speculative, but that's... Well, but th this is actually the point is, it's just speculative, let's go to political reality. So I'll give you two examples of political reality around this. Let's just pick Medicare for all. So if the thesis is that these ideas, of which the single centerpiece is Medicare for all, will energize all kinds of voters and win elections, if that's the thesis, which it clearly is, if that's the thesis then, let's look at the general election advertising of the Democrats in the 84 competitive races. Well, it turns out I asked my staff to do that, and a bunch of them sat around and watched 286 Democratic ads on health care to see what Democrats were saying since they're putting all their money into winning their races and turning out voters. Not one. 
Not one Democrat in the 84 competitive races is running an ad that says Medicare for all. So unless we think that all 84 of those Democrats are idiots and have no idea how to win the races, which would be horrific news for the country, but if, if that, unless we think that, it means they took a hard look at it and they said, you know what, these ideas aren't going to win me elections. That's not how I'm going to win this fall. I'll give you one other... Well, um, let me, let, you gave an example. I want to let your, yeah. your partners, uh, opponents respond to something. Yeah, and I, you know, I've seen the polling that informs the DCCC's messaging on this. And let, let's be clear. I mean, you're, you understand this, that these candidates, by and large, get messaging from the DCCC about how to message on health care and a whole bunch of other things. So they can obviously disagree with that, but many candidates do message off on what the DCCC sends them. The DCCC... Uh, is very hesitant about Medicare Just policy. Just so for, for listeners who don't know it's what the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee is. And they, the and arm of the Democratic Party, which supports House candidates, House of Representatives. Great, thanks. Uh, you know, I just think their advice is wrong, and it's, and it's borne out. 80% of Democrats in polls support Medicare for all. 52% of Republicans. How can you say that that is a losing well, be, issue? Because you're Andrew saying, Gillum just won a primary in Florida against a bunch of millionaires on the issue of Medicare a, for All. You're citing a poll. I'm citing an actual ballot initiative. Well, this in is Colorado, they ran a ballot initiative for a Medicare for All system. It lost 79 to 21. It lost in Boulder, Colorado. Andrew so Gillum is Forget won. polls that questions can be asked anyway. And by the way, Kaiser Foundation, who is the gold standard on health care research and polling in the United States, Kaiser can produce numbers for you that show Yes, a majority of people support it, and then the moment you start telling them anything about it, the support completely collapses. So instead of a theory, Bernie would have won but beaten Trump. Medicare would work if you did this. Let's look at the reality. The reality is they're not winning. I'll give you one other thing on the midterms, because this is really important. We can't redefine who won these gen who is in the general election candidates. Of the 84 competitive races. 76%, right, three-quarters of those folks have been endorsed either by the New Democrats in the House or the Blue Dogs, the conservative Democrats in the House. Just 4% have been, been endorsed by Justice Democrats and our revolution. So look at who's actually running. The people who won these races are moderate, mainstream Democrats, and they're the people who, God willing, are going to put a check on Trump and hand us back the House. Can I put something else into the conversation? I, I want to be very careful about how I phrase this because I am, I am not drawing comparison between the content of what candidate Trump put out there to the public with the ideas that, that, that the progressive side is putting out there. I am not drawing that, but I am drawing the notion of his finding a way to excite and rattle the bars of the cages that a lot of Americans felt they were living in to the degree that they voted for him along with those ideas, that he went out and played the populist game and made big promises that I, I think, talking about political reality, two years ago, political reality was that he could never get elected, and yet he pulled it off. So what, what is that example show for, the, for, for your opponent's argument, that big, sweeping, dangerous-sounding ideas in a positive way, given how they're framing it, they're framing it positively, could actually have this impact on the electorate and pull off the unpredictable, even though no sitting Democratic president ever ran on those ideas before. Steve Ratner. Look, look uh, first of all, I don't know that Trump had very many big ideas. He had a slogan, make America great again. And, every, and, and it was actually quite brilliant, you know, even though he stole it from Ronald Reagan in that. No, but he pushed buttons. He pushed, he pushed all kinds of you know, buttons I'm, I'm that are. I'm getting sure, to yeah. that point. Look, the fact was and is uh, that there are still huge numbers of Americans who have been left behind. When you look at median wages adjusted for inflation, when you particularly separate them out and look at what's happened for, to people toward the bottom, even during the Obama recovery, hard as a President Obama tried to make it better for everybody, the fact is that for a variety of reasons, you had a large group of Americans who felt uh, angry, who felt left out, who felt left out by the Democratic Party because it was worrying about a lot of other interest groups, or at least they perceived that to be the case, and they decided to vote for Donald Trump. And as I said during my remarks, it is almost without precedent. I think there are maybe two or three examples in 200 and some odd years of someone of the same party as an eight-year president succeeding because people like change. They want change after eight years. So Mrs. Clinton, and she had three million more votes than Donald Trump anyway, but they were in not exactly the right places by 70,000 votes. And so you had a kind of perfect storm of events that caused him to be elected. I don't, think, I don't think the fact that he got elected suggests that Medicare for all, let me just say one thing about Medicare for all and then I'll shut up. When you say, if you go to any of these people, half of Americans get their health care from their employer. 
you say to them, you're going to lose your health care from your employer and you're going to become part of government health care, you think they're going to support that? Apparently, Elizabeth Warren thinks they do. Kirsten Gillibrand thinks that they will. Cory Booker thinks that they will. These are all people who are going to be running for president of the United States, I'm just in case it had escaped you. Bernie Sanders thinks they will. Every senator, U.S. senator, who's thinking about running for president supports Medicare for all. Not everyone. And, 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 and I would say that... Jeff Berkley's... Uh, I, I, which, yeah, senator, which, which person which, running for the U.S. And, and, US senator? Well, we don't even know who's running yet. I would say, and I would say to you that if one of those people gets nominated on that platform, we will lose, we'll have four more years of Donald Trump, and we will be deeply, deeply regretful about that. We will, we will only lose if the people who back your ideas and fund your ideas and are major funders of the Democratic Party fold up their cards and go home like the Donald McGovern and, 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 at other times. If your wing of the party stands with the progressive nominee... For, forget my wing of the party. Win. Forget my wing of the party. 33% of the country are Democrats. How do you win an election, even if you get every single one of them, how do you win an election because without reaching half out? Of millennials are independents. This old notion that it's Democrats, moderate independents, and Republicans on the right is that old outdated notion that has no reflection in American politics. There's a huge bunch of particularly young people who are independents who are over here, not in here. And when you move, do what you do, which is move to the right, those people don't vote for Republicans. The they right. go away. I haven't moved to the right. I Look. want to go to audience questions now. Um, there's a gentleman on the third row aisle, and my name is Will. I have a question for both sides, actually. One thing that I've noticed has been kind of ignored in this debate over progressive populism and uh, democratic policy writ large is uh, uh, foreign policy and defense spending. Like, we just passed a $720 billion bill with essentially token opposition. I know Bernie was against it, but we've been engaged in two wars for 17 years and potential conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and possibly so, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So, your, so, your so question my question is, what do you consider, what should the Democrats do for foreign policy and how should they differentiate themselves from the Republicans or if they should at all? And, for both and, and sides. Is, is there a progressive populist position on foreign policy? Um, let me take that first. Karine, do you want to take that? Take, no. Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? I'm good. Well, in, in fact, I would refer you to a couple. Uh, Bernie just gave a speech at Johns Hopkins uh, yesterday, before yesterday, and he had an article in The Guardian not long about that, uh, concerned about the. Uh, international uh, rise of what he called an, an axis of ultra-right nationalism, which we're seeing around the world, unfortunately in this country as well, Russia, Poland, Hungary, Israel, um, we've now seen it in Brazil, uh, and we have got to bring countries together around the world uh, to combat that, right? I mean, we're, we're st again, talking about the 1930s. But th what that does not mean is that we go to war every time there, there's, you know, some economic interest of the billionaire class is being attacked somewhere. This is the history of foreign policy, certainly in Central America and Latin America in this country, and certainly in the Middle East. I don't think anybody here in this room can seriously say that if we weren't addicted to oil, that there would be any Americans in the Middle East. There are lots let of me, places. Let me, let me stop you there, because I have a feeling your opponents are going to agree with everything you just said. Yes. <laughs> OK. All right, so I don't think we have a point of conflict on, on that issue. Yeah. Uh, just a little point of fact here. It is uh, true that. 2016, 2012, the voter turnout was around the same. Uh, however, in 2016, it was significantly down among people of color and among uh, working people. Uh, do you think that nominating somebody who gives paid speeches to Wall Street, who uh, doesn't really have a very good record on race baiting, criminal justice reform, was the right choice given those factors? I think that's a fair question for this debate. Karine, do you want to take what, that? What was the, I'm sorry, what was the question? He, he, he's, <laughs> I'll, I'll, he, he, well, do you, do you want to put it, do you want to name names in your question and make it very clear? Hillary Clinton was a centrist and was uh, from the Wall Street wing of the party, and uh, her numbers suffered among, uh, the overall they were around the same as Obama's, but they suffered among low-income people and people of color. And what you're really saying yeah. is, had there been a populist, maybe Bernie Sanders, instead right. of, instead of um, Hillary Clinton, would we be with the President Trump today? I think that's your question. Yes. Uh, I'll take it. To yeah, I think, I think what we saw in 2016 with Hillary Clinton and, and uh, people of color is that they were, not, they were not inspired to vote for her. They were, the issues weren't there. They weren't talking to them. Another thing that was happening around that time in 2015 was the Black Lives Matter movement. Which, which really played um, into uh, uh, Hillary, the Hillary Clinton's platform, right? The crime bill came up, 
which was a big issue that came from, from the moderate Democrats, and it played into uh, the elections of, of 2016. And so there was a lot of feeling from, in particular, young, uh, young black voters who didn't feel that uh, the campaign was talking to them, who didn't feel that there was a place for them, because they remembered the Clinton years, because of what was happening in 2015 with black, young black bodies being killed on the streets. And uh, there was, they didn't feel like there was an answer to that for them. And so there, were, there wasn't, uh, they weren't spoken to, they weren't, they were interested. Right, let me they take were not excited to come out and vote. Let me take your point to, uh, to John yeah, Cowell. So, uh, 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 I think you have to, I think it's a great question. It's a fair question. But I think you have to disentangle problems with Hillary as a candidate from the question tonight, and the question tonight is, was not, was Hillary Clinton a crappy candidate or not? <laughs> That's not the debate motion. The debate motion is, if a candidate in the future carries these ideas, will that candidate win? And so far, just to be clear, I've not heard much evidence that that's the case. And I think you really have to distinguish the difference between liking some of the ideas, whether you think they're good or bad ideas, from whether they'll win. And I've not heard evidence that those ideas would win. So for example, Medicare for all, if it were such an overwhelming popular idea, how could it lose 79-21? Let me ask you this, if it were such an awesome idea, why wouldn't the 84 Democrats, who don't all just listen to the Democratic Campaign Committee, they're running their own campaigns. That's right. If they had an idea of how to win, why wouldn't they do this? They're not doing it because whatever you think of the merits of these ideas, they're not politically popular in enough places. One last point on this, this is very important, is Jeff cited the senators who might run for president who support Medicare for all. He's right, that's true. They're all from safe blue places. <laughs> They're all from safe blue places. Our job as a party is not to figure out how to make blue places bluer. It's how to make red places blue and purple places blue. That's our job. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would say a couple of things. Uh, and you're right. You know, I think progressives in this party have not gotten... You can stop at your right. That's okay. <laughs> progressives have not gotten a, a fair shot in this party in terms of funding and other things and, and, and an audience uh, over the last 20 years. But what we do know is that your point of view has destroyed the party. And so it cannot be but worse than what you... how do we know you, that? My, my point of your view free, was... Because your free trade deal no, but, but wait just destroyed the relationship with, with the working class Democrats. Your call for cutting Social Security is going to kill this party. You guys represent a certain group of interests. I get it. It's cool. Like, this is a big tent party. But you cannot be the dominant voice in this party because you have no credibility with working people. When you go out and talk to real but, people but, whoa, in the real world... Whoa, wait, wait a minute. No. We have no credibility with working people. So just to be clear, because you and Bernie have said this many times, my people are Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. You've no, said that a million people. times. You said Barack Obama wasn't progressive. So no, I, the I, two people who are our people were widely supported by working class people. Barack Obama built an amazing coalition. In fact, I think our challenge is to rebuild the Obama coalition, the centrist Obama coalition, just to be clear, because that's actually what we have to do. So me, I don't know what you mean. I, 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 I want to add some, I want to, you make a point, then I want to add something to yeah, what was just said. So, so there's, there are a couple of things here. The Obama coalition was people of color, young people as well, which was a big part of the Obama came, coalition. They came out in record numbers. Obama would not have won in 2008 or 2012 without them. Trust me, I know. Yeah. I worked on both campaigns. Wait, let me finish. Let me finish. So you took you took offense when I can't remember what Jeff said to you. But Almighty, the, Almighty's been taken. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't. I can't remember. He said you but don't the, care about working class people. Okay. The moment that I bring up the crime bill, right, and I say, hey, that's something that you guys pushed forward. Now, oh wait, we're talking about Hillary Clinton as a candidate. The crime bill hurt with black people. And the question was, why didn't black people come out, especially young black people? And it was because yeah, wait, wait, of that. I'm gonna say one thing. Look, let me just say one thing. Barack Obama didn't support any of your policies virtually. He didn't support Medicare for all. He didn't support free college tuition for everybody. He supports Medicare support, for all now. He, 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 talking he said about it. 20, that was, talking, that was he, 10 he, years ago. We're talking about 2008. Things have changed. Yes, but he got elected because he... And he supports it he, now. He, he, he said he it. Got a, I don't think he supports Medicare he, for no, all. No, he said he, it. 
I, we actually said it. Go to the okay. internet, folks. Let's also go, go back. Please Let's, go to the internet. All right, all right, all right, Tim. And I want to throw something into this conversation that comes from an interesting direction. Uh, the other day, there was an op-ed attacking Medicare for All. It was written by Donald Trump. Oh, gosh. Sure. Was. And he said, he said, quote, the truth is that the centrist Democratic Party is dead. And Joe Biden reacted to that. Uh, by the way, Biden has not confirmed whether he's running in 2020 or not, but he told a reporter for USA Today in London, tell Trump he should hang on. So what do you make of Biden's response? Does, does Trump's characterization of the party have any traction with voters out there? And does Biden have anything useful to say about it? I'm happy to. Um, Trump is saying that because his greatest fear is running against someone like Clinton or Obama, Bill Clinton or Obama. That's, how, that's why he thinks he'll lose. The centrist, if the centrist Democratic Party is dead, I'm not, you know, the centrist wing of the Democratic Party is dead, I, I'm not sure then exactly what we're debating. <laughs> um, if you see, if Democrats regain the House, a third of the Democrats in the House will be self-described new Democrats. So far from the centrist Democratic wing of the party being dead, it's alive, it's well, it's robust, it's elected the last two Democrats to the White House, and, and I think this is really important, from my point of view, and this is not the subject of the debate tonight, but you should know it, I don't believe that the way to win is a reprise of 1990s Democratic centrism any more than I believe a reprise of 1960s Democratic socialism the way to win. We're in a new era and we need something different. But that's not the question tonight. The question tonight is, are the ideas like Medicare for All put up, is there evidence that those will win elections for Democrats? And there isn't. The other side to respond, and then I'm going to go back to questions. It's not just Medicare for All. There's also debt-free college. There's affordable home ownership. I think you guys are sticking on that because for you, know, for you, you think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that wins. I, I want to, you talked about winning, uh, you talked about examples of elections recently to where candidates have won. I'm going to bring up a candidate right now, um, Connor Lamb, PA18. Uh, Can you explain what PA18 yeah, is? Call, call, Pennsylvania 18, Congressional District, uh, very red, uh, very red uh, uh, district. Connor Lamb, Democrat, won the district. Uh, which was, I think it had been held uh, by a Republican for more than 10 years, if I, if I get that right. And um, Move On members had endorsed Connor Lamb before it became a national uh, a race. And they endorsed him early and worked really hard for him, uh, not because, oh yeah, he's this, he, he's this progressive. It's because of the issues that he was running on. He was running on protecting Social Security. He was running on protecting Medicare and Medicaid. And so I guess the point that I'm making on is the issues matter as well. Those issues that I'm just talking about matter. Now, where do you guys stand on that? Where does Third Way stand on Social Security? And, that, and, and I think that matters because you're talking about that our issues are not going to win the day. But where are you guys on Social Security? Uh, so I'm delighted to answer that. Uh, just to be clear, though, the debate tonight is not about our platform. We have a robust one. <laughs> A I, big, robust one. I, I actually agree. Right. I, I don't want to spend. So time. I'm just saying. So I'm happy. I would love to have a debate about our platform. I think it's powerful, compelling, and would build a winning coalition, and is exciting and ambitious. But that's not the conversation tonight. My, just so to be clear, um, protecting Social Security isn't a Sanders position or a progressive populist position. It's a position that I can't really think of many Democrats who don't hold it. There's a um, woman with black sweater and eyeglasses. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Kath. I'm wondering, you mentioned the New Deal, and I, I was just looked it up and it said the marginal tax rate when to, in order to pay for that program went from 25% up to 53, up to 94%. And most other countries that have the, you know, Medicare type for all, it's 70%. How will you get, like, hard, normal working people to be willing to pay 70% increase in taxes in order to pay for others. And I assume your question is, is put something as a challenge to the foresight, correct? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, there's a recent study out, and, and uh, again, on Medicare for All, let's also point out that over half of the Democratic members of the House of Representatives support Medicare for All. There's co-sponsored legislation in support of Medicare for All. So this is not a fringe idea, by the way. Uh, there was just a report that came out of uh, a very conservative uh, school in Northern Virginia, which showed that, uh, in fact, uh, aggregate healthcare spending in this country would go down 
uh, substantially if you had a Medicare for all system. So will people be paying more taxes? Yes, they will be. There's no doubt about that. You can't get around that. Will they pay less in premiums? Yes, because they won't pay any premiums. They won't pay any copayments. They won't pay any deductibles. We're going to finally be able to get our hands around the pharmaceutical industry who's yep. ripping off uh, this country and charging us the highest prices in the world. So in the aggregate, our country is going to save money. It's going to be good for business. Believe me, I have a small business with seven employees selling comic books like crazy in Northern Virginia. I would love to have Medicare for all, frankly. Um, and so anyway, so, so, so yes, people will have to pay more for in, in in the taxes, but they will pay less in other ways, and in the aggregate, people as a whole will pay less. Steve right there. Look, again, this is not a debate about policy, it's a debate about politics, and I would uh, remind, I would just say one more time, that I do not believe if you go to half of Americans and say you're going to give up your employer-based health insurance and come on a government plan, they would think that was a great idea. But to answer more specifically the question about But Steve, you, you, you say it's about, not about policy, it's only about politics, but you made the argument in your opening that these programs can't work. So they're saying, yes, they can. So I, I think it was fair to come back to you at that point. Well, that's a policy question you want me to answer. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you, want to, if you want to completely turn our healthcare system inside out along the lines of what Jeff is saying, we could, we could talk about that as a policy matter. It would end up probably looking something like the National Health Service in the UK, which if oh. you go to it, no, let me finish, Jeff. But that's something people are can I Can I just finish? He can finish. Let him finish. Uh, what well, well, you just outlined, the things you just ticked off, sounds a lot to me like the way an, any national health, pick anyone you want, work. And if you go to one of those places, if you ask people in Britain, do they like their health care, they would say, no, it doesn't really work for them. But I want to make a, a slightly different point, because the question was really about taxes. And you made the point that Clinton was elected in 1992, and, he, and we lost the House in 1994. Why did we lose the House in 1994? Because Bill Clinton raised taxes, and the people did not want that. So there is a, a limit to what amount of tax. I'm for tax increases. I said that in my opening remarks. You can raise my taxes to whatever you want. But I think it has been well proven in this country that there's a limited tolerance in America and the way people think of America for raising taxes beyond a certain point. And I don't think it works politically. OK, I want to go to some more questions. Hi there, my name's Jen. Um, I have a question for each side. Um, to what extent do you think representation in the United States would be benefited from a third party? Um, I think that... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on the question because it doesn't go to where we are tonight on, on the question of progressive <coughs> politics. So unless you want to reframe sure. on I mean, the Sure, just the fact that it's constantly like your side it, as if like it's a different party. Um, there seems, I mean, there's always in party fighting, but um, it... There seems to be a claim of who is the true Democratic Party, and I guess... That I like. Okay, great. <laughs> Which of you is representing the true Democratic Party here tonight? <laughs> no, can I answer that seriously? Yes, I, yeah, the, I, I asked it seriously. The political par <laughs> political parties, uh, we don't represent the Democratic Party alone, and they don't represent it alone. The, the, the definition is b uh, of the thing you're supposed to do is build a winning coalition that does not just include your side or other people. There, so there's a wide range of views. The point is, if you want to get sustained, if you want to get the White House back and large sustained Democratic majorities to do good things for the working and middle class of this country, you have to build a winning coalition. That's the math. And you have to have ideas that will not impede you from building that coalition, but will help you build that coalition. Our argument is simple. Not that these, we're not debating every merit of the idea, but will they build a winning coalition? And when you look at it, they don't actually do that. Kareem. Yeah, I, I, ugh, man, I have such a problem with that because what we're asking for is inclusivity. What we're saying is if you reach out, yes, the middle uh, uh, working, white working class in the middle of America absolutely matters. No one is saying we don't talk to them. We're saying like, hey, there are brown people, there are black people, there are young people that needs to be reached out to. It needs to be inclusive. That's what we're saying. That's how you build a winning coalition. And it, and it needs to be multiracial. And so for decades now, that those folks that I just mentioned have felt left out. We have, we have felt left out. Now we're at a point in 2018 where we see candidates across the country in red states and blue states that are representing everyone. 
And so that's the argument here, at least that I feel, which is you have to have inclusivity, you have to include everyone, and it needs to be multiracial, and we can't go back and just focus on one group. Can, can, can I just a quick response to that? I agree, yeah. 100%, 100% that you have to have a diverse coalition, and there's a lot of folks who haven't been represented well and spoken for well, and part of, part of uh, the, the Democratic Party. That isn't actually the question tonight. The question tonight is, what ideas should those diverse group of candidates carry? What should they carry? And will those ideas enable you to win? So my question, my name is Paul. Uh, my question is more for the populist progressive side. Uh, so for people who are skeptical about too many government programs and being dependent on government health care and government funded education and are uh, fearing sort of losing their independence and freedom of choice, someone who is more moderate like me, who has left the Democratic Party and become an independent because I don't particularly relate with a lot of these ideas, how do you win me back? Bingo, what a great question. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take that. I mean, that's, that's right on the table, so. so well, that's good, and, and you know, by the way, you're an independent, but of course all independents are not created equal, right? I mean, there's a whole broad range of independents, some of which are, again, to the left of the Democratic Party, some are to the right of the Republican uh, Party. Uh, what I would say to you is, on the issue of free tuition of public colleges and universities, we already have K through 12. I think we all support probably going down to pre-K. I don't know if you guys are in that camp or not. Uh, so we have an arbitrary uh, deadline where it, once you get past 12th grade now, we cut you off. We didn't used to, by the way, in New York State and California and other places. You didn't used to get cut off at 12th grade. Uh, that's an arbitrary uh, thing that's been put in. I know Steve doesn't want his kids getting a free ride, but if his kid shows up in first grade, he's gonna get a free ride. That's just the way we work it in this country. We have universal, secondary, primary, and early education, and hopefully it's earlier. There's no reason why we can't have it for uh, undergraduate school or even graduate school. There's not, our European allies do, uh, in many of cases, do do it that way. Uh, and what we have in this country is a great loss of talent of young people who either choose not to go to school or come out of school greatly indebted, and there's research that shows that people have so much debt that they delay making major purchases, they delay getting married, they delay having kids, and a whole host of other things. And we have got to be, if we're gonna compete in the international environment, and I know these guys are all into competing in the international environment, as I am, as Corinne is, we have got to have the best trained workforce in the country. We gotta uh, maximize the human capital of our population, and that means having people who are educated. That has a okay. great social benefit. That's Jeff, not I, just a... I, I have to wrap yeah. this section. I just want to say to the gentleman who asked the question, so Jeff made a pitch to you on, on one of the particular programs that would cost money by showing you what the benefits would be. Did you find it food for thought, persuasive, any of those things? You certainly found it food for thought. Good job, Jeff. Okay, interesting. Um, I, I don't think there's a response to the other side. I'm happy to respond. Go ahead. All right, well, take it, Steve. Yeah. I, I, I would just say that this gentleman actually epitomizes what John and I are trying to persuade everybody about, that there are a large group of people out there, some number, I don't know what, who find the policies espoused by our worthy opponents to be not what they can relate to, and therefore they have left the Democratic Party and become independents. And the chances of them voting, I hope they'll vote for another Democrat, the chances of them voting for someone from the populist or progressive or whatever you want to call it, although I think I'm a progressive, wing of the party are very low. Jeff just gave like a really great sales pitch for one program, probably one of the more popular programs in, on their list of programs. But I would love to see him go through that whole roster of things that he and his candidates espouse and I'd see love to do if it. he can convince that, can let that me know when. gentleman, no, not me, that gentleman, uh, <laughs> to become a Democrat. Let me also make one other, <laughs> let me make one other comment to what, what, when Jeff was telling his opening history story, I don't know if you noticed, but he skipped from 1994 to 2016. <laughs> but something really significant happened then. In 2009, Democrats controlled everything the White House, the House, and the Senate. So something, the real marker isn't 1994, the real marker is 2009, what happened since then. I would argue that a big piece of what's happened since 2009 is that Sanderism and progressive populism became more and more and more prominent and more identified with the Democratic Party such that it drove a lot of voters away. We have to remember 2009 was the high water mark in recent years for Democratic majorities and Democratic control of the White House. And again, Sanders said that Obama wasn't progressive, but Obama won twice and built a historic coalition. And I personally think, and I know Steve agrees with this, 
did some fantastic things as president that I'm really proud of as a Democrat. Yeah, yeah, this is really, a, look, it's really, a, you guys are really setting up a, a, a straw, like, you guys are really setting up a straw man. I mean, it's ridiculous. I know, on, on, on that note, I need to say oh, that that concludes, God, that concludes on. round two of this what? Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, uh. where our resolution is progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. So I know all four of you have a lot more you want to say. I want to see if you can pack it into your closing statements. These closing statements will be two minutes each, making his closing statement in support of the motion, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Jeff Weaver, senior political advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders. We, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Listen, we as Democrats have a challenge. We have got to build the coalition in this country that can beat back Trumpism. We cannot allow this country to go down that very dangerous road. Today we're seeing young children locked in cages, torn from their mothers. That's only the beginning of what can happen in this country. And to do that, we have got to rally working people and marginalized people and young people, excite them and bring them into the political process. The challenge facing the Democratic Party today is, is it going to be relevant in 10 years? Young people are overwhelmingly registering as independents. We have got to build the party of the future. We have to have bold vision. We have to have big plans to deal with big problems. These guys have had their shot. They have wrecked the party. They have destroyed the coalition that undergirded the Democratic Party for decades. And we can't let them have it back. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Weaver. The resolution again, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Here to make his closing statement against the motion, one more time, Jonathan Cowan, co-founder and president of Third Way. Why was it so important for me to be here tonight, and why am I so passionate? On the morning of November 9th, 2016, my twin 10-year-old daughters woke at 7 a.m., and in their bright, innocent voices, they asked, is Hillary president now? That look, the shock on their face when I said no, Donald Trump won. I don't ever want to see that again. That's why I'm here tonight. And that's why all of you are. The question is, are progressive populist ideas the way to stop Trump and his allies? The answer is no. And two house races this year tell the tale in microcosm. In Omaha, Nebraska, Kara Eastman, a Bernie-style populist, is trying to win back a swing congressional seat Democrats held as recently as 2014. That district is so even that the last three elections were decided by three points or less. Perfect conditions for a blue wave environment. So with all that, Eastman must be in great shape. Right? Kara Eastman, running passionately on Bernie's agenda, is getting crushed. She's down nine points. Meanwhile, in central Virginia, Abby Spanberger is running as a mainstream Democrat. Her Republican opponent won that seat by 16 points two years ago. Democrats haven't held this seat in 40 years. Her race is tied. We may actually flip a red seat because we ran a bold and modern centrist Democrat. Saving the Democratic Party requires winning everywhere to regain the House now and to fire Trump in 2020. As Kara Eastman's situation makes clear, we can't save the party. We can't win general elections with a set of socialist ideas and candidates that even the most, and even most Democratic primary voters just rejected. To save the nation from Trumpism, I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan Cowan. The resolution again, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party, making her closing statement supporting the motion, Karine Jean-Pierre, senior advisor and national spokesperson for MoveOn.org. So, where I work at MoveOn, our millions of members form a big part of the Democratic base. As we listened carefully to our members, we learn about their priorities and what motivates them. And it's not centrism, and it's not incrementalism. It's a bold progressive vision for our future. Let me tell you about Chuck T. Chuck is a veteran who joined the Army to pay for college. 
In the army, he fell in love with being part of something bigger than himself. Now one of our Move On volunteer leaders, Chuck says progressive policies reflect the core army values instilled in him through a decade of service that he sees championing progressive policies as his second service to this country. Or think of Carmen V, a Move On me member who says centrist Democrats have never inspired her to do more than vote. But she has been inspired recently to act by issues like incarceration reform and separation of immigrant families and by progressive public officials like Beto O'Rourke and Jeff Merkley. She is now simultaneously volunteering, not just for Move On, but for several progressive candidates. If the Democratic Party will be saved, it will be saved by volunteers and activists like Carmen and Chuck. And what they themselves tell us is that progressive ideas inspire them. Activists like Carmen and Chuck will save the Democratic Party. And majority of voters who strongly agree with Carmen and Chuck will save the Democratic Party. I think it's already evident to probably most of us in this room that progressive populism is the direction of the Democratic Party. Therefore, I hope you vote today for progressive populism to save the Democratic Party. Thank you, Karine Jean-Pierre. And that is the resolution. And here to make his statement against it, here is Stephen Ratner, chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors and former counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, look, this has been a, a great discussion. We've heard lots of valid statistics, maybe some that aren't quite as valid, but lots of very good arguments. <laughs> and I do want to genuinely commend our opponents for their passion and their commitment to the democratic cause. I'd also like to close on a, with a more subjective, personal observation. It may surprise some of you, but even as a business person, I live in a world that is dominated by centrists, moderate Democrats, independents, and moderate Republicans. Not all my friends are financial types. They include lawyers, academics, journalists, public servants, and so forth. Within that universe, I know very few people who voted for Donald Trump last time, and even fewer who would vote for him next time. But I also know vast numbers of people who say they could never vote for someone like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, not because they're not good people, but because of their ideas. But my friends simply don't believe that the policies of the far left are fiscally responsible, nor that they would improve the functioning of our economy, which for all of its challenges, which I will recognize, is still the envy of the developed world. So to me, it comes down in large measure to practical realities. Nominate someone from the fringe of our party and we could very well end up losing an election two years from now that by all rights we should win. On the other hand, I am confident that any Democrat who can bring our party together and appeal to the tens of millions of independents would triumph and end our national nightmare. Thank you and please vote no on the resolution. Thank you, Stephen Ratner. And that concludes closing statements in round three of this Intelligence Squared US debate. I wanna say that you know, Jonathan alluded in the beginning that we said, oh, we really like our debates to be robust. Uh, the four of you delivered really well on the robust, and at the same time, I think that with maybe a one hiccup along the way, there was great respect shown for each other. Uh, you really, uh, I, I think in the end, at some level, you might actually all be on the same side, um, but this, this, you made the disagreements among you meaningful and fruitful and illuminating for all of us. So I just want to thank the four of you for bringing one of the best debates we've ever had. And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. We want to ask you a second time to go to your cell phones and vote again. While we're waiting for the results, I just want to put um, a question to, to everybody. Um, this is not competitive at this point. Um, <laughs> just, and, and maybe you don't have a ready answer, but that would be an answer in itself. Curious to think who you should be leading the party in 2020. Aww, oh, man. Steve Ratner. <laughs> You're the only one who didn't groan. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think some of the people that one could think about, and I'd be happy with any of these kinds of folks, would be Steve Bullock, the governor of Montana, Michael Bennett, senator from Colorado, Mitch Landrieu, who just stepped down as mayor of New Orleans. I think that's the zone I would be in. Anybody else want to venture a name? No. I will give you a pass if you want to say no. I'm not going to touch you with a 12-foot <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else the same? What? The last three words of my book, in all fairness, are run, Bernie, run, so. <laughs> that makes it easy. <laughs> all right, all right. 
It's all in now. I have the final results. Remember, on this resolution, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. It's the difference between the first and the second vote that determines our winner. Here's how it went. In the first vote, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party. Before the debate, 33% of you agreed with that statement, 40% disagreed, and 27% were undecided. Those are the first results. In the second result, the team arguing for the motion, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party, their, first, their vote went from 33% down to 22%. They lost 11 percentage points. Let's see, the team against the motion, their first vote was 40%. Their second vote was 74%. They pulled up 34 percentage points. That makes them the clear winner. The team arguing against the resolution, progressive populism will save the Democratic Party, declared our winner. Our congratulations to them and everyone who took part. Thank you from me, John Donvan. Goodbye from Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time.